Welcome back anatomy students. Today we're going to continue our discussion of the specific immunity. Today we're going to talk about the humoral response in particular. If you remember humoral means normal bodily fluids. So the humoral response occurs in the lymph and the blood um, and it deals with B cells. So this is a B cell with some receptors and it's finding some pathogen. So that's going to be the humoral response. Okay, let's start with a comparison with the humoral and the cell-mediated response. For me, this has come up in three different lectures, so hopefully my students have a pretty good idea of which is which. The humoral, remember, is blood and lymph, so the B cells are found in the blood. The two Bs can go together, and it involves antibodies and um, takes care of extracellular threats, so things that haven't gotten into your tissue cells yet, viruses, bacteria, any other extracellular threat. The T cells are involved with cell mediated. That's another lecture. So the cell mediated response, just as its name says, is in the cells. So in your tissue cells. Um, and this is going to defend against then intracellular threats. So if it's inside of the cell, it's cell mediated. If it's outside of the cell, it's humoral. And then um, the cell mediated will destroy the cells themselves that are infected with pathogens, whereas the humoral response, the antibodies will bind um, the pathogens and then a macrophage will eat up the, the pathogen so they don't destroy them directly. Um, unfortunately, cell-mediated response also tries to get rid of um, transplanted tissues and organs because it recognizes those cells as not belonging to you. Um, and fortunately, it takes care of our cancer cells, so we don't even know that we have cancer. Okay, more about the humoral response. So B cells can be activated by a chemical called cytokine. So they are activated by cytokines that could be released from maybe a helper T cell. Um, they might come across a pathogen in the blood or lymph. They hang out in your lymph nodes and your spleen. So um, as the lymph comes through the lymph nodes, for example, um, it comes into contact with your lymphocytes like your B cells, and when they come in contact with um, an antigen or they receive a cytokine, this stimulates them to start differentiating, so they become specific to their job, and they proliferate, and proliferate means to make copies of um, themselves. So here one of my students drew a B cell and it's making some memory cells and some plasma cells. So plasma cells are used for here and now. It's going to take care of this infection today. So um, it's going to start making antibodies and those antibodies will serve a specific purpose. Some of the cells will then last a long time and they'll be called memory cells. So this is our adaptive or acquired immunity. So we don't have it until we've been exposed to it. And then once we've been exposed to it, we can fight it off in the future. So we might not ever get sick from that same um, disease. So the plasma cells have a short-term life, um, and then the memory cells have a long life, and they, they last for years. And that allows us to respond more quickly, efficiently, effectively um, to a second exposure. So antibodies are the main function of the humoral response. Um, the plasma cells will make one of a number of types of antibodies, and the antibodies are called immunoglobulins. So that's kind of a descriptive term. Um, they contain two regions, a constant region that determines their class. So there's five different classes you can see here. And the constant region is this portion down here. So within class IgE, IgE stands for immunoglobulin. So within the IgE, that portion will be the same, and that determines its class and how it functions, how it will get rid of um, foreign invaders. This top portion up here is variable, so this top portion will change according to which antigen it is going to bind with. So there's five classes, and a mnemonic we use is the woman's name, Madge. So they spell out Madge, M-A-D-G-E. Each one functions a little bit differently and has different capabilities. For example, the IgG can cross the mother's placenta, but the other antibodies can't. IgA is in breast milk, tears, and saliva. Um, so different antibodies might be found in different locations. Um, 
On this slide, it might be easier to see the difference between the constant region and the variable region. So here, the dark shaded blue and pink, that is the constant region. So that's the region that determines its class. And then up here, the lighter portion, the light pink and blue, that is the variable region. So that would become very specific um, in order to meet the binding sites of different antigens. So this is where our variability comes in for our um, immune system. We can see that there's four chains, four polypeptide chains that make up the antibody. These long ones, that would be called the heavy chain. And if you just think the longer they are, the more heavy it would be, um, that would be a good way to remember it. And then the short ones are the light chains, and that makes sense. They just look like a smaller polypeptide, so that means it should be lighter, right? Um, over here, this is just giving you an example. The antigen, that's the foreign invader. Um, it has several different shapes, a half moon, a V shape, a puzzle piece shape. So you can see that an antigen has um, a number of different shapes as well. We will try to meet that shape with a specific antibody. So when the antibodies or when the B cells differentiate, um, they adapt in order to be able to recognize that antigen in the future. And it has the ability to recognize self from non-self cells. So um, when we talk about these shapes, we should be able to use more specific words. If we use words, we're more clear. So we'll use the words epitope and paratope. So remember, epi is above or upon. We've used that in almost every chapter. So the epitope is found on the antigen itself. So the binding sites here, it's kind of squiggly. Here it's a puzzle piece. Here it's the V. Um, these end pieces, the binding sites, those are called epitopes, and those binding sites try to bind with your cells to gain access to your cells. So the job of the antibody is to try to keep that from happening. So you can see this: the antibody has a matching shape, and its matching shape is called the paratope. Para means around. So the paratope fits around the epitope. So each of these individual shapes are called paratopes, and if we have names for them, it's a lot easier for us to be on the same page when we're talking about in these shapes instead of saying the end pieces. So what does an antibody do? It will not destroy the antigen directly. That would be the job of the T cell, however. Um, it will bind an antigen and basically tag it, mark it for destruction, make it easier for um, a neutrophil or ma ma macrophage, some sort of phagocyte to find it. Um, quite often that happens due to neutralization. Um, I have a video clip that I show in class. Um, I could link that below if you'd like. It may also form agglutination, which is clumping together. Remember when we talked about um, red blood cells, when our antibodies attacked the antigens, it caused them to burst, and then the proteins were sticky, and it caused the cells to stick together. That's agglutination. Or precipitation. So if you remember from chemistry class, precipitation, um, solid particles will settle out of solution. So the binding of the antibody to um, the antigen causes these things to happen. They might also function in collaboration with the complement system. So remember we talked about 20 different complement proteins with the nonspecific defenses. They also function in the specific defenses. So neutralization, um, the, the antibody, those are the Y shapes, right, in purple for all of these pictures. They will bind to the binding sites of the antigen. So if they are occupying that binding site, that binding site wouldn't be able to bind with one of the receptor cells on your tissue cells. So that way they won't be able to gain access to your cells. Um, they might cause agglutination. So here you have a number of antibodies working together. They're all bound together. And by doing so, they bind all these other bacteria. So this makes a bigger target, a lot easier for a phagocyte to find it and eat it up. And then over here we have precipitation. So maybe this antigen is soluble in solution. Um, and remember that's where we find uh, the B cells and the antibodies is in our, our humors, our fluids. Um, so the Ys are the sticks, right? Those are the antibodies, and these are a pathogen. These are drawn by one of my students. So um, 
and an antigen will bind more than one pathogen and you can see um, that causes a bunch of them to bind together. This causes them to be heavier and therefore they will settle out of solution. And again, any one of these three make it easier for a phagocyte to find and to eat them up. Um, with the complement system, this will look very similar to um, what we saw in the nonspecific defense. So you have antibodies and you have um, your, your complement proteins and they will bind together to make a lesion, a pore, um, that allows fluid to rush into the cell. Here you see the cell looks like it's blowing up, right? So the fluid is rushing in, causing it to expand and eventually lice, it explodes. So the antibodies work in one of those different ways, depending on its class. And that's all I have for you today. Um, hopefully, like these memory cells, this information will stick with you. Thanks for listening.